something happens, just text me or uh, Eric, if something happens or if you, if it cut out. All right. Um, again, for everyone, this is basically a medical disclaimer that what I'm about to teach you guys is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure any type of disease. I was in Pennsylvania and I veered off the road and went over the side of an overpass and I don't really remember much of the accident. I was ejected from the vehicle and found me on the ground outside of the vehicle. I woke up 12 days later in the hospital because I didn't know what was going on. They said that there was no movement, that I had no movement, basically the chest down. No movement in there, in my legs, no feeling. Y'all told me. I got ready to get the legs moving the first time I came in here. It really made me excited. Y'all made my legs move the first, the first time I came here. Like something happened. I don't think I will walk again. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to go over Asia eight quads because so Nate's case was an Asia eight quad. And then if you guys don't know what Asia stands for, I'll go over the different, um, the different classifications. So, okay. So within the United States, so the leading cause of spinal cord injuries are motor vehicle accidents, uh, basically about 38% of spinal cord injuries. 30% uh, due to falls, 13% to violence, 9% to sports injuries, and then 5% for medical uh, surgeries. And then globally, you're seeing about 250,000 to 500,000 patients are suffering a spinal cord injury every year. So the numbers are going up, um, especially as you see here, motor vehicle accidents. And this is what got me uh, really thinking about a different way to treat spinal cord injuries is based off of this right here. Um, the one thing that happens in spinal cord patients is that when they have a spinal cord injury and they go to the hospital, they're going to be treated for a spinal cord injury. Um, not a lot of people are actually looking at a spinal cord injury as an actual brain injury. And especially if it's in a motor vehicle accident where the patient was ejected, um, there was any type of stress response to the vestibular system a lot of times what happens with spinal cord patients is they start getting underlying infections. They start having autonomic changes. For example, they have blood pressure issues. Uh, most of them typically will have low blood pressure. Um, they'll start getting edema. Uh, they'll start getting gastrointestinal issues. And those actually also resemble a traumatic brain injury. And so from doing this, and I hope that everyone that follows and listens to this recording they understand that just because someone has a spinal cord injury, don't just look at the actual spinal cord. And I always use an analogy with my patients, and I tell them that it's a lot easier to take a snowball and basically start on the top of the mountain and push it down a hill. And as you do that, you're going to see the snowball is going to get bigger and it's going to start gaining a lot more momentum. And when you have some sort of blockage and you have some sort of trauma or miscommunication in the spinal cord, it's a lot easier to basically come from up top down than it is actually from the bottom and actually try to push it back up. And that's one of my secrets, I think, to helping patients with spinal cord injuries. All right. So spinal cord compression stands out as the most prevalent mechanism leading to spinal cord injuries that may persist beyond the spinal cord injury. The onset of bleeding during spinal trauma also occurs in early stages of the spinal cord injury, followed by sequential disruption of the blood supply. And I'm going to talk about lasers in here, but this is the main thing is that if you start to improve blood flow, you start to improve function. And that's one of the things, especially in the early stages of the spinal cord injuries is there's lack of blood flow to the actual spine. And if you don't get good blood flow into the spinal cord, you're not going, you're going to see a lot of scarring and that scarring can also start to prevent neurological output from the way the actual cortex is going to communicate to the spine. And then from the spine through the peripheral nose to get uh, um, peripheral nerves, to get these patients moving. All right. So the aftermath of a spinal cord injury, you see hypoxia and local ischemic infarction, uh, particularly affecting the gray matter, which is where the metabolic function is elevated. And then neurons in the effective area undergo fracturing accompanied by a reduction in myelin thickness. 
So I tell people that think of synaptic pruning in the brain. You don't use it, you lose it. You're also seeing that actually happening within the spinal cord. Okay. Um, so within a spinal cord injury, there's basically two primary mechanisms. The primary injury uh, is typically considered irreversible. Um, so basically, this is the actual trauma to the actual spinal cord. Um, a lot of patients that I typically see, especially in a motor vehicle accident, a lot of times they'll have a bone fragment that actually, you know, punctures the spinal cord, and then you get scarring in that. So in the primary injury, what you're going to see is cell death, so apoptosis, axonal disruption, and you also see inhibition of axonal growth. Um, and then the other aspect, the secondary injury, this is where research is showing that it's actually reversible. Um, and so in this area right here, what happens is, is this is where microglial, neutrophils, macrophages, lymphocytes, um, and chemokines. Now, this is where, when I start looking at this research, and again, I put some really cool papers, uh, references for all you guys, came out of China 2024, which is actually literally came, well, basically this year I looked at it. Um, but this right here is all regulated by the immune system. And this is also regulated by the vagus nerve. So it's very important to work with spinal cord patients and actually detecting their vagal tone dysfunction. And then those of you guys that understand, you know, functional neurology and actually understand the health of the frontal lobes, we can actually literally activate the frontal lobes in these patients to actually improve the immune system. Or if you start seeing some of these patients that develop autoimmunity because of they're actually getting lack of cortical input into the right frontal lobe, you might see they might start developing mast cell activation. They might start getting POTS. Um, they can have lots of dis different dysautonomy. And it's very important to actually, one, stimulate the vagus nerve in these patients. But also, I do a lot of bilateral stimulation. So I'll do a lot, a lot of stimulation to the right frontal lobe where I'm using different colors, using essential oils, trigeminal nerve stimulation. And then I'm also going to be stimulating the actual left frontal lobe as well. Again, using colors, smells. So in these patients, I'm actually stimulating both sides of the hemispheres when I'm working on trying to get these patients to move. All right. So if you get a patient that comes to see you and they tell you that they're in Asia A, Asia B, Asia C, Asia D, Asia E, what does that mean? And it's basically just the American Spinal Injury Association, which is where the Asia comes from. So it's basically a scale and it's a scale of dysfunction. So I clinically see a lot of Asia A quads. So Nate, who you guys just saw earlier was an Asia A quad. Um, so what is an Asia A quad? is there's no sensory or motor function uh, that's preserved in the sacral segment. So basically S3 to S4, which is the lowest part of the spinal cord. Um, then you have an Asia, a, an Asia B, which is a sensory, it's an incomplete. So you have sensory function is preserved below the level um, and that includes the sacral segments. Uh, no motor function is preserved and the individual has no voluntary muscle movement. Then you have an Asia C, which is a motor. It's an incomplete. Uh, more than half of the muscles below the neurological level have a grade of less than three. Then we have an Asia D, which is a motor incomplete. Uh, more than half of the muscles below the neurological level have a muscle grade of three or more. And then you have an Asia E, which is a normal function. So I'm going to show you guys a video of, uh, of a case that I had. This guy was Ben. Um, ben came to see me uh, a year ago, and what happened is, is Ben was actually washing, he was pressure washing a boat, and he slipped and fell, and what happened is, is um, someone took the, uh, the seat in the front of the boat, and they left the pole up, so he's about 350 pound guy, he lands completely on his T10, completely fractures, breaks his back, he got diagnosed in Asia A quad, uh, fortunately for Ben, uh, his neurologist and his nurse practitioner sent him to me within four to six weeks. And we immediately started doing all what I'm going to show you guys. And within one year, um, he's actually now at an Asia A grade D. Um, and he's now fully walking. And I'm going to show you guys the video and show you how I did that. All right. Again, another really cool research paper from 2015. Um, so the research was called this, this really cool paper, by the way, printed out. 
So it's called the Current and Future Medical Therapeutic Strategies for the Functional Repair of Spinal Cord Injuries. And really this paper is going to be for those of you that really want to kind of do not just, you know, rehabilitation, but also understanding the immune aspect of spinal cord injuries. And so one of the, in the primary injury, what I want to highlight here is there's vascular effects. Obviously there's going to be lack of blood flow. Um, there's membrane damage, there's cord compression, there's glutamate that gets released. Now this is very, very important because what happens here when you see that this is where you start seeing oxidative damage, where the membrane can get degraded. Dr. Genevieve, you know you know this, but benagene, oxaloacetic acid, is unbelievable for basically eating up glutamate. So when I get a patient who starts having a lot of clonus, they have a lot of severe spasticity, uh, they have a lot of pain, maybe they start developing muscle fasciculations. Um, sometimes patients think it's a good sign, but I just want to let you guys know that uh, excessive glutamate from an inflammatory condition, uh, oxaloacetic acid, uh, benagene is the actual product that I use to actually break this stuff down. Um, and then you start seeing systemic factors, neurogenic shock, respiratory failure. Um, one of my cases um, recently was a guy named Jeff, and Jeff went to go watch a, um, a motocross event, he and his son. And they're standing watching and all of a sudden he wakes up and he's basically in a full halo and he's, he's, he's in a hospital. What happened is, is a tree completely broke and fell and hit him in the back of his cervical spine. He had a burst fracture. Um, it actually completely dislodged um, his C6 vertebrae into his esophagus. Um, and this guy, um, he's got crazy, crazy blood pressure issues. And so he told me, he said, look, man, like literally when he just goes from a transporting, literally just from a wheelchair, just to a bed, um, he almost passes out. And so he went and seen a uh, cardiologist and they told him to just take a pinch of salt before he actually does that. And he told me, he said, look, there's got to be a better way. And when I evaluated him, what happened is I asked him, I said, did anyone ever test you for a concussion? And he was like, they said I had a little concussion. But he was a little discouraged because he's been doing therapy and seeing some of the best spinal cord doctors. But this guy had a freaking tree, a big, massive tree, fall on the base of his neck, basically has a hyperextension, hyperflexion injury, which means that in his vestibular system, which is going to detect basically head position, and you're also going to have this fluid that's going to be moving around, it gets basically disrupted. And so this guy literally has crazy excruciating neck pain blood pressure, blood pressure fluctuations, and he's having to take salt. And from a neurological perspective, when I do an evaluation and I look into his mouth, his uvula was like super low on his left side. So his salt palate. So what I started doing is actually teaching his wife how she could actually do vagus nerve stimulation while we start initially working on transfers. And guess what happens? This guy is actually blood pressure started staying stable and he didn't actually pass out. So these are kind of some cool things that we can actually start to do clinically. Um, all right, the other thing is just another little bit more in depth. So if some of you guys want to look at, um, you know, differences here. Uh, so tumor necrosis factor is actually in the left frontal lobe. Um, and so it's showing that, you know, an excessive amount of this stuff right here can induce apoptosis. Um, so again, I per firmly like using uh, vagus nerve stimulation, uh, especially a lot of times on the carotids, uh, on my spinal cord patients. And I pulled this paper for those of you guys who've been listening to us for a while over glutamate. Um, but glutamate is something that happens following a stroke, and it also happens following seizure activity. It also happens after a, uh, after a spinal cord injury. So oxaloacetic acid. Okay, so I shows you here, the main cause of ischemic neural death is glutamate excitotoxicity. So it's extremely important to make sure that when you work with these patients, whether it's a traumatic brain injury, whether it's a patient with seizures, whether it's an autistic kid who's stimming like crazy, or you get a spinal cord patient, um, highly, highly recommend you guys look up oxaloacetic acid and benagene. It's a phenomenal product. 
It is sometimes a little bit expensive, but it works amazing. Okay. So when I'm working on cases, um, especially if we're going to just kind of take spinal cord injuries, what I also want to recommend is those of you guys that do do um, images, QEGs are my favorite thing to actually do, because what I want to do is actually look at the motor strip area of the brain. And I also want to look at the parietal lobes. And those are two th areas of the brain that I find that clinically, if someone's involved in a motor vehicle accident and they're paralyzed, or if someone had a TBI and they're paralyzed, I really like to actually look at what the motor strip looks like. The second thing working with spinal cord patients is also to basically um, really start understanding neuroanatomy. Start really looking at the actual motor strip. Start looking at the parietal lobe. Start looking at the midbrain. Start looking at the pons. Start looking at the actual medulla. And then actually start studying the neuroanatomy of the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine. And why it's very important is because you actually have to basically become an electrician when you're working on these patients. You're going to be a contractor, which is where you're going to take a blueprint of basically neuroanatomy. And then you're going to become an electrician. And now you're going to start studying all the wires in the circuitry and the pathways. And then in that, we need to really understand cranial nerve function. Okay, so sensory input builds and helps with brain development. And it's very important that you guys really, really understand the cranial nerves because any deficit in the cranial nerves, basically you're looking at feedback from the environment to the brainstem back up to the cortex. But then in the spinal cord patient, the way they're going to move is that we're going to see the cortex is going to send its signals down the brainstem, down into the spinal cord. And so I have found, back to the analogy of a snowball going down a hill, is that the cranial nerves, if you stimulate these, you're going to activate the brainstem, which means that you're going to start to improve the metabolic threshold and the capacity of the brainstem which means you're gonna improve blood flow. And then if we start stimulating, which I'm gonna show you guys, the motor strip and the parietal lobe and the cerebellum, as it's gonna to communicate to the spinal cord, we can start to build a way better feedback loop. And that's exactly how we're gonna use neuroplasticity or in typical physical therapy terms, neuromodulation to try to get these patients legs and arms and stuff, fingers and toes to start to move. Then we have primitive reflexes. They're very, very, very important to also acknowledge in working with patients with spinal cord injuries. Again, if predominantly most of these patients who sustain spinal cord injuries are typically found to have motor vehicle accidents or some sort of physical trauma, a lot of times there's actually disruption with the frontal lobe potentially hitting the cranium, um, or maybe there is a you know, it's maybe someone was shot and they saw themselves, you know, there's a threat. So maybe they have a moral reflex. It's very important because these primitive reflexes reside in the brainstem. And that's going to say that we're going to have immaturity within the brainstem, whether it's the medulla, whether it's the pons, whether it's the uh, midbrain. It's very important because these areas, as I'm going to show you, are very important to actually even activate muscles. Then we have posture reflexes. They're very important to work on as you start to integrate primitive reflexes because as these patients start to move, we wanna make sure that we actually build a protective mechanism so that way they don't fall and hit their head um, and they don't sustain a concussion. Um, and it's also going to help out with them with actually moving. And then we have breathing and oxygen. I am a massive, massive fan of exercise with oxygen, so EWAT. Um, some people can practice with oxygen, some people can't, um, but in, in some states you can actually use exercise with oxygen. So basically EWOT is a face mask that's connected to um, basically a hose to a big bag and patients can actually breathe in oxygen while you're trying to activate them. I found clinically that this really helps out with basically me being able to extend the amount of stimulation that I give a patient is by actually using exercise with oxygen. So as we're doing exercises, we're also oxygenating the body. And then it's actually building up core stability. 
all the way. All right. Um, another really great paper, just basically over the pathophysiology and pharmacological intervention. Um, but one thing that's very interesting what I want to point out here is that in animal body, uh, models, uh, blood transfusion and dopamine can provide normal tension, which can lead to an increase in blood flow to the spinal cord. And I just want to highlight that for you guys to see that a lot of times what happens when someone has a traumatic brain injury, um, doctors sometimes will put them on a methamphetamine to basically wake the brain up. Um, I'm personally a big fan of actually using uh, dopamine precursors. Um, so one of the things that I like to use is from Apex Energetics, something called Dopatone or Dopaflow. Dopaflow is kind of nasty. But I also like to put patients on dopamine precursors um, so that a way I can basically follow the research here and basically use um, dopamine to also help out with um, increase in blood flow to the spinal cord. Again, it's basically showing that um, it's helping out with uh, just basically coordination. All right. Um, I've done this one before about uh, in a POTS case that we did, but just to kind of show you guys, when you look in someone's soft palate, um, maybe you've seen cases where a spinal cord patient can start to develop AFib, and uh, it's very common um, that when you see someone who has AFib and you look into their mouth, their soft palate's going to be lower on the left side. So then I'm going to clinically treat that patient by doing left vagus nerve stimulation, the auricular branch in the left side. And then you may see patients who are going to have a lower salt palate on the right side. And then we can actually stimulate in the right ear. So what I see clinically is typically someone with tachycardia normally is going to typically have more of a lower um, salt palate on the right side, which is a right weak vagus nerve. Okay. And then we see patients who have AFib. Um, a lot of POTS cases that I work with, again, not every POTS patient, but a lot of them clinically, a lot of them actually have um, salt palate weakness on the left side. Okay. And so just to show you guys, but positional changes, if you have that patient who's having a hard time with positional changes um, from a metabolic standpoint, definitely salt water is something that we've used. And what I've done in my clinic is just get small little bottles of water put a little sodium in it, a little salt inside of it, shake it up, and I'll have the patient drink that. Um, I use uh, a sauna in my clinic. So I actually have these patients get into this big sauna pod with like red lights and vibration. I have had um, some patients where um, just using low heat initially, their blood pressure has dropped. And so what I do before I put someone in there is actually give them a little bit of water with salt and then what we'll do while we're in there is we also stimulate the auricular branch while they're actually in a sauna. And so the goal for that is to just basically use heat to actually improve blood flow. Um, those of you guys that are looking for maybe other alternatives, there is something called the higher dosage. It's a sauna blanket that we've used, uh, especially on some patients that we can't transfer and put them in. We actually do use this blanket. We'll zip them up. Um, and I'll basically use a little heat um, to help activate. Now, there's something, there's a pathway called the anterior lateral spinal thalamic tract that deals with pain and temperature. And when you look at the neuroanatomy of the spinal cord, which I'm going to go over, um, that's actually a pathway. And so we're going to use in our clinic, we're going to treat spinal cord injury patients with sensory stimulation. And I'm going to activate uh, the heat pathway, I'm also going to activate the cold pathway. So that's the anterior lateral spinal thalamic pathway. Um, so I like to use heat nice when I'm working with patients. Um, just to give everyone who's not familiar with the soft palate, but looking in the back of the throat. So in a scenario like this, this patient right here, I would actually be taking a stem pod and I would be doing auricular branch stimulation in the left ear, because if I look at this, this is a little bit lower. And then if it was vice versa, where the salt palate was lower on the right side, then what I would do is I would actually do auricular vagal stimulation in the right ear. Okay, so just some research. If you're a PT and, you know, you're in a nursing home or you have to validate everything that you're doing, um, this is a really great paper that's going to show that transdermal, transdermal auricular stimulation 
can actually help out with POTS and it's just gonna show you the different mechanisms. Uh, but this is a very, very common symptom to see with spinal cord injuries. Um, if you don't have a stem pod, um, the other thing that you can do is actually just laser in the carotid on the same side. So if it's lower on the right side, the soft palate, I can laser the right carotid. If it's lower on the left, I can laser the left. If I don't have a stem pod or a laser, one of the things that you can do is something called cranial electrical stimulation, uh, CES. There's little bitty uh, clips that you can use. There's also something called the alpha stem that you can actually use. There's another thing I have a PT that I work with who uses a dolphin stem. It's basically the similar thing to the pulse pointer that chiropractors used to use back in the day. Uh, now it's considered a dolphin stem. And then the other aspect is Dr. Cedarmark's way with just humming and gargling. Just basically humming and gargling can activate the vagus nerve. And you can have patients do humming or gargling while they do transfers to prevent them from getting dizzy. All right, let's go with this. Okay, so if a patient sustained a severe motor vehicle accident, so that young kid that you guys saw earlier, um, that kid, his name was Nate. Nate was on his way home to go surprise his mom. He worked a late night shift. Um, he fell asleep at the wheel. Um, he gets ejected off of an overpass, um, has a T10 spinal cord injury. Uh, he did have brain swelling. Um, and so in a scenario like that, it's very, very important that if you want to comprehensively work on these patients, that you also look at running stool samples if you can, because this is something that I got from Dr. Cedarmark. Here's an example of a brain injury. And then under a microscope, you're going to see what's called intestinal permeability, which is basically known as leaky gut. Then you see a healthy brain, um, and then you see a healthy GI tract. So it's very common to see patients with spinal cord injuries also start to get urinary tract infections, UTIs. Um, and what a UTI, these patients can have some major setbacks, just like with brain injuries. So a couple of things here. One, I like to recommend something called d manos It works awesome, and it can actually help prevent urinary tract infections in patients, whether they're a traumatic brain injury or whether they're a spinal cord injury patient. Um, works really, really awesome. I also have clinically seen that patients can maybe start developing kidney infections, or maybe they can say kidney infections, kidney stones. And if that patient starts to develop kidney stones, um, a lot of times what happens from a nutritional standpoint is they can actually have a phosphorus deficiency. So Standard Process has a great product called Foss Food that I actually use for patients who start developing kidney stones. And then the question goes back to well, what's really going on. And from an immune system standpoint, I'm a very big mold and fungus guy. Um, but let's just say that this patient has a, you know, a motor vehicle accident. They get diagnosed with spinal cord injury. No one addresses the traumatic brain injury. And this is exactly what's going on in the GI tract. Let's say this patient has not been taught about diet modifications, or maybe they had a significant amount of antibiotic in the hospital and no one told them about taking probiotics when they got out. So then this person comes home and they go back to eating their regular diet. And because of the brain injury, because of that, they're going to have, obviously they're going to have some weak vagus nerve function. And the purpose of the vagus nerve is that it's going to basically help the body rest and digest, which means that if we're going to rest, we're going to need stomach acid production, hydrochloric acid. As this happens, the pancreas is going to release digestive enzymes to help break down the food. And if we eat a high carbohydrate diet with a brain injury or poor vagal tone, we might not be able to break all the carbohydrates down. So that's going to turn into sugar and sugar is going to basically feed abnormal gut bacteria, which leads us to something in functional medicine called intestinal dysbiosis, abnormal gut bacteria. And then what happens is, is it's very common for us to start to see candida infections, which means now when you have the patient open their mouth, they're going to have a really white coated tongue. And that's not good. Okay, because then what happens is, is clostridium produces a byproduct called propionic acid, which is a neurotoxin. Okay, and now you're starting to see this vicious cycle. So then anything in the GI tract is also gonna get passed to the kidneys and liver. 
And if we have inflammation in the gut, we're going to get inflammation in the kidneys and the liver. And if we get inflammation in the kidneys, what happens is, is calcium is used as a buffering agent to modulate inflammation. So calcium can make its way into the kidneys and then boom, now you start to see kidney stones. All right. So that's just a mechanism of how that stuff can happen from that. All right. I'm a very big fan of peptides. Um, so I just want to put the ones that I typically use uh, clinically, C-Max, uh, Cerebral Lysin, and Thymosin Beta-4. Um, you guys can research these, but these are just some great peptides that you can also recommend the patient actually do. Um, uh, C-Max just basically shows it's a neuroprotective, anti-inflammatory. It has um, some research over spinal cord injuries. Uh, cerebral Lysin was also kind of studied originally from uh, Alzheimer's. Um, but I have seen that work really, really well. And then thymosin beta-4 uh, basically also has been shown to help out with regeneration. Okay, so now is the fun part. So um, studying pathways. So when you, if you guys do QEG testing, um, one of the things that when you look at the motor strip, you're often going to see a lot of underactivity in the motor strip and also in the actual sensory cortex. So let's trace basically how the corticospinal tract is going to go. So it's going to go from the cortex, from the motor strip. It's going to come all the way down and it's going to go to the midbrain. It's very important because the functions of the midbrain are going to be your pupils. You're also going to see vertical eye movements and convergence. Then we have the pons, which is going to deal with trigeminal nerve stimulation, facial nerve stimulation, vestibular cochlear stimulation. So music therapy can work really awesome. Also, yes, yes is no no's motion guidance. Um, and then you have horizontal eye movements. Then we go down into the medulla where the vagus nerve is and also where the tongue is. And then you go down to the spinal cord. So if we go back to the analogy of a snowball pushing it down a hill, the goal here when you're trying to get someone with a spinal cord injury or any type of upper extremity or lower extremity paralysis is to actually know the neuroanatomy. And what I want to do is something called stacking. I want to basically stack. So I want to put some sort of stimulation on the motor strip, whether it's going to be a PMF pad uh, or PMF band. I use the neorhythm from Omni or neorhythm. Um, I'll do that on the motor strip. I also can do transcranial direct stimulation where I can put stuff like the brain driver, the Fisher Wallace, the Neuromist directly on the actual motor strip. Then I can use uh, pupillary constriction flashlights um, in the pupils. I can use uh, eye lights. Um, I can incorporate NeuroSage. I can do vertical eye movements, play different games, roll the ball. Uh, trash dash, brick breaker. For the pond stimulation, I love trigeminal nerve stimulation. I'm going to show you a slide on that. Uh, vestibular rehab and then using music therapy. For the medulla, I'm going to do auricular branch of the vagus nerve. I'm also going to um, use tongue stimulation, whether it's vibration on the tongue, um, whether it's a stem pot on the tongue, but it works amazing. There was uh, some research, um, what was the name of that device that I told you about? Right. Brain driver, not brain driver. Uh, something V100. So I was reading this research over, um, it was blind people and trying to get them to move. And um, brain port V100. it's called the brain port V100. And it was this device that they were actually putting electrodes on the tongue and patients who are blind could actually start to see with uh, a microprocessor or a micro projector, literally projecting um, visual stimulus to the tongue. It's crazy. And then I read another research paper that I showed Dr. Crawford. And I was like, I read this paper about uh, people that were blind and deaf and had strokes. And they actually started trying to play literally videos to the tongue of like telling them to move their arm and their leg. And these patients could actually move their arm and the leg. And that goes back to looking at this. People say, well, how in the world? Well, when you start stimulating basically the brainstem, you're literally getting into the communication between the cortex and the spinal cord. 
And I absolutely love dressing every one of these. Okay, so if you work with spinal cord patients, you need to actually really look at this uh, slide and you need to have like, you know, snapshot, uh, put this up into a presentation when you work on spinal cord patients so they can actually understand what you're going to do. So I tell my patients, I'm like, look, I know that you've been to some of the best doctors and the best therapists. Um, what I'm here to do is basically be like an electrician. And what I want to do is I want to make sure that the sensory input, everything blue, is going to basically be able to hopefully try to stimulate the brain. And then I want to turn around and I want to address the way the brain or the cortex is going to communicate to the spinal cord. And so by studying these pathways, you can do a lot of really neat stuff. And so when you look at here, look at the back of the spinal cord. And so this is called the DCML pathway. It's massive. And this is going to be proprioception. So vibration is one of the best things that you can also use for patients. Um, then you go in and actually start looking at here. So the spine to the cerebellum. You can start doing stuff like figure eights. Um, this is a great, great way to actually activate the cerebellum. Then you have over here the spinal thalamic pathway, which is going to do a pain and temperature. So hot and cold. And then spinal olivary, I love to use uh, metronomes with patients. Then you come over here and look at the corticospinal tract. So we can actually stimulate the actual motor strip in the brain. Then you start going into the brain stem and you can start stimulating, you know, the pawns. So you can do gaze fixation, you can do motion guided, you can do VOR reflex. Um, all of those spinal tracts start stimulating the olive. You can start doing stuff with tongue stimulation, metronomes. Um, then you go into this area right here, the rubrospinal tract and reticulospinal tract and actually start stimulating the midbrain, pupillary constriction. Okay. All right. So just to highlight real quick. So these are basically just motor tracts. Um, so the corticospinal, the anterior corticospinal, the rubrospinal, reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, tectospinal, olivary spinal. Okay, so those of you guys that are new to neurology, everything in neurology is connected by an O. So big fancy words, but basically cortex to the spine, cortex to the spine, that means the front, uh, rubro coming from the red nucleus. And so you can see this is actually coming from the midbrain which is gonna actually activate flexor muscles. Then you have the reticulospinal, vestibulospinal, tecto. This is where it's really awesome to use stuff like light and sound, okay? Then you have the olivospinal tract, which is I love to love to see motor coordination. I love to basically do workouts with metronomes, okay? I did this slide in Australia for those of you guys that are watching or that are gonna basically follow the recording. Um, this is like the Mac Daddy slide. Um, and I just want to highlight that when you're working on patients who have paralysis in the lower extremity and you're working on the motor strip, if you see the legs are way down here. So I typically go to the top of the motor strip um, right here, whether I'm using um, a TCDS, um, whether I'm using the InterX comb, uh, whether I'm doing photobiomodulation, but what I want to do is if I'm going to do this, I'll typically use an infrared laser on the top of the head. And then as I come all the way down, you're going to see all the different ways that I want to do. So um, one way to laser the midbrain is that you can also go intranasally. Okay. Um, you can use eye lights and then you can use eye movements. And then when you go to the pawns here, you can do lots of cool stuff. We can do facial stimulation. Uh, so tens pads on the face, vibration to the face, uh, facial contractions. You can do gaze fixation exercises, the motion guidance. Um, patients who can stand, I also do do a lot of um, the balance tracker. They're on this basically pad. Um, we go front to back, left to right, diagonal while we're supporting them. You also, once they're standing, you can start working on canal positions um, and then horizontal eye movements. When we go into the medulla, um, we can laser the vagus. You can stem pod the auricular branch. Uh, or you can also stimulate the tongue. And then we go into the spinal cord. Um, I'm going to laser the spinal pathways. Um, you can uh, laser muscle weakness on any area that's weak. You can stem pod. 
or you can use your peripheral nerve stimulation over the whole entire spine, and then you can vibrate the spine and extremities. Um, this is a great slide from Dr. Crawford uh, that we did in Australia. Uh, so the research here, if you guys want to look, trigeminal nerve control of cerebral blood flow. And they're showing what happens when you do trigeminal nerve stimulation. But I want to highlight a couple of things here. Substance P actually is a pain inhibitor. So if I have a patient who's got low back pain, knee pain, instead of working on the knee, I'm going to put some TENS pads on their face, and then I'm going to work on the area of pain. Great way to reduce pain. Look at the next thing, ATP, basically energy, neurokinin, peptide, NO, nitric oxide, PACAP. This is a, this is a, this is a relaxation peptide, so rest and digest. Then you go into VIP, uh, vasointestinal peptide. It's going to help out cell and gut and brain barrier, acetylcholine, making nerves fire and function, all that from stimulating the face. So if you follow me on social media and you look at any posts that I have, all my patients basically have trigeminal nerve stimulation because it's so important, but I love cranial nerve stimulation. I think that's the missing link in all of healthcare, especially in rehabilitation. Um, so I'm going to basically stimulate the actual trigeminal nerve because my goal is to start getting blood flow into the pons. It works phenomenal with patients who even have POTS. Um, I just wanted to highlight the difference between uh, TENS units, and then also like I use the Sabo Stim. Uh, this is what I use in my office here for facial stimulation. Um, so different some ways to stimulate the trigeminal nerve. Uh, you can stim pod the face, you can vibrate the face, uh, you can laser the face, or you can use what I use here, the Sabo. All right, so uh, QEG testing. This is what I basically do. So I just want to show you, this was uh, a 39-year-old 39 male who came to do an intensive with me. And um, you can see here, 227.39. Um, so basically, this was his first scan. And then after an intensive with this, you can look to the right and actually see. So it works like this. White is normal. Anything to the left is under activity. You have negative one, negative two, and this deep blue is negative three weak. Anything to the right is gonna be hyperactivity. So you have plus one, plus two, and then red plus three hyperactive. So when I look at this guy, and again, this guy right here, he's he was paralyzed for about two years. Uh, dove into a pond in Michigan, hit the top of his head, uh, really big old guy. Um, and he dove into this lake all the time. It was just one day he dove in. They had a little uh, drought. The water was low. Hit basically something, a rock at the bottom of the sandbar. Boom. But guess what happened? He hit the top of his head, which is where the motor strip is. And this guy was very discouraged because he's got young kids and he wants to basically be able to, like, you know, interact with his kids, use his arms and his legs. He can't do it. And... Um, he comes to see me and I'm like, dude, did anyone tell you you had a concussion? And he was like, no, they told me you had a spinal cord injury. And I'm like, well, look, when I'm looking at the motor strips here, look at how much underactivity you have. So guess what I did? I stimulated his motor strip the whole time. And look at that. As I started getting into these higher brain waves, you start seeing that it's actually, it's still weak, but we went from literally completely negative three week to about negative one week. And the cool thing is, is I got this guy to actually start to be able to move his fingers and his toes. But because one is that no one is addressing the actual motor strip in the brain. And it's super critical. So if you want to get someone's toes to move right here, this is going to do a throat. OK, so again, back to that slide that I showed you about the um, the Mac Daddy slide. Start studying the neuroanatomy of the placements and you can actually start putting Fisher Wallace's. Uh, photobiomodulation, electrical currents, um, all of these different areas of the motor strip while you're simultaneously trying to either do some sort of sensory or some sort of motor response to an extremity. But make sure you look at co-activating the motor strip. Okay. Then as we get to some of the higher brain functions, look at this. I mean, gamma, 40 hertz. Look at all this weakness. And then you come and look at this one, and again, it's not that much of a difference, 227 to 36. What happened is, is you know, I tell people, where your awareness goes, energy follows. 
So if I start targeting all these networks in the brain and I'm using photobiomodulation, I'm using electrical stimulation, um, I'm actually like the patient visually knows what I'm doing and then you start seeing now, look, now they're starting to become hyperactive networks. These networks are getting active. Again, just another kind of, uh, this is the uh, profile report. So you can actually see that he started with both of his motor strips, like really underactive. And then after doing an intensive, um, you actually see that it's underactive. I mean, it's actually normal, although he does have a little bit of some fatigue here. All right, um, just to show you midbrain stimulation, the rubrospinal tract is in the midbrain. So not that the, what I'm trying to do here is I'm gonna use pupillary constriction or tectospinal. So I'm gonna use uh, light, and then you can also even use a metronome that you can synchronize it with this. There's also a device if you can't afford or you don't want to purchase the eye lights, you can actually use the Metro Timer app which is going to basically have a rhythmic movement and it's gonna flash at the same time. So you can use light and sound to start stimulating the midbrain while you're working on someone's like shoulders or their hips. All right, so the blood supply to the spinal cord. Um, so you see the vertebral artery um, in the anterior, so the anterior spinal artery right here, blood supply to the spine. One of my favorite, I, you know, I learned this from Dr. Crawford, but the Russian blood stimulation. So laser in the carotids, laser in behind the ear, basically the cerebellum to activate the vertebral artery, laser in the umbilicus, so the vertebral artery to start getting blood flow to the actual lower extremities, and then lasering the spinal cord is very, very important. And then again, I didn't mention, failed to mention, but the posterior spinal artery. All right. Um, this is from Dr. Cedarmark, um, lots of stuff, but basically showing right here that there's evidence that show photobiomodulation can help the brain to repair itself by stimulating neurogenesis, upregulating brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and encouraging synaptogenesis. That's huge because we wanna see that whenever we see some sort of injury and we start seeing you know, inflammation in the spine, we need, as earlier as I mentioned, we need to start getting blood flow into the spinal cord. And this is where red light makes a significant impact. Okay, so what does it look like? Cerebellum behind the ears, spinal pathways, uh, laser in vagus over the carotids, laser in vagus over the belly button. Um, clinically, I like to use the setting that I put in there, Dr. Daigle all, or I'll do photobiomodulation over any extremity that's weak. Or I've also used the gamma, um, brainwave under the brainwave settings, or we also have muscle tone enhancement and muscle weakness settings that you can use. But I'll just tell you that I clinically use the Dr. Dagle wall. All right. Um, this is for chiropractors. The vestibulospinal tract activates extensors in the back. So it's very important, the vestibulospinal tract. So vestibulo coming from the vestibular system, which comes from the pons and the brainstem. So literally from the vestibulospinal tract, from the pons, it's going to basically come and innervate our intrinsic muscles that are gonna stabilize the spine. And then it's also gonna stabilize our extensors, like our quads and our tibialis anterior. So when a patient has a spinal cord injury, they're basically going to typically fuse the whole spine, okay, with basically rods. And I would encourage you guys to basically do vestibular rehab or at least start doing gaze fixation exercises with the patient if you can. Um, start using the motion guided with guidance with, with your patient if you can. Um, maybe start doing some VOR reflex with the patients. And then what I like to do is basically along the spine, I like to have vibration. I also like to have uh, maybe uh, some sort of stim. Um, I'll put whether it's uh, the Sabo stim, TENS pads, um, even the Interrex up and down the spine, but I wanna basically incorporate some sort of vestibular stimulation while I put a stimulus to the actual paraspinal muscles. Um, Again, for basically what this stuff is considered as neuromodulation. Um, some research that I did back in Australia, just to show you guys uh, why TENS units typically don't really get good motor output. 
Uh, so the purpose of a TENS is because it's an activation for pain relief, um, typically going to be below 50 hertz, which is below the motor threshold. Um, then you start looking at anything basically above 50 hertz is going to cross the motor threshold, which is why someone asks me all the time about, well, why, you know, if I just put a TENS pad on someone's face or a TENS pad, pad over a nerve, uh, am I going to get the same output, you know, or the results as you? And the answer to that is no, because you need to make sure that you're using stimulus is above 50 hertz to basically breach the motor threshold. Okay, so what am I using? Uh, Sabos, Alpha Stems, um, uh, the Fisher Wallace, not Fisher Wallace, uh, the ARP Wave. I'm using the Interex. I'm using the Stem Pod. Um, I'm trying to think of what else did I use? Frequency uh, microcurrent or frequency specific microcurrent. Those are all the different electrical devices that I'm going to use over spinal nerve roots or over uh, different peripheral nerves to get these patients to start moving their extremities. Um, I just put on here some of the placements that I do use for the stem pod. Um, really like coming down the actual spine, um, also going down the actual brachial plexus. Um, love, you know, hitting the wrist extensors. So this is just a patient that, you know, I basically marked up um, so that way his mom knew exactly how to stimulate him. The other thing is actually using the actual stem pod over at the ending acupressure points. I have found that this works really, really awesome. Um, another little really neat device that you can look into is called the uh, Sabo uh, Stem. They actually have a hand glove. You can use this for spinal cord injury patients. You can use this for patients who have hand contractors. It works really, really awesome. Um, I did put on here that you can use one of my favorite acupressure points, Shen Min in the ear. Uh, I like to do bilaterally. Um, from a music perspective, uh, gamma waves is something that you can use. So 40 hertz, uh, laser placements, uh, laser in the cerebellum. If you're trying to get the hand to move uh, spinal pathways over the cervical spine. And then you can also use sensory motor or gamma or even Dr. Daigle all over the paralysis area. And then you can also even throw in an electrical stimulation over heart seven. Um, which is basically an acupressure point that we use a lot to actually work on palmar reflexes. So this is basically what it looks like in our clinic, working on spinal cord patients. Lots of photobiomodulation to the paraspinal muscles. This is a stem pod actually on the paraspinal muscles. And then what I actually have is um, electrodes over stomach 36 and spleen 6. And this is basically us trying to get this Go ahead and move, move. Leg to move. The muscles on the left side of our body for me, okay? What? Okay. So this was us getting Nate to actually move his leg. And so what happened was, is I actually had uh, some photobiomodulation over his motor strip directly over where his toes are uh, on an infrared laser. I was also using the Interex comb directly over that same area. And if we go back again, go ahead and move. The he's got trigeminal nerve that stimulation. That okay. He's stimulating his tongue. And then he's actually able to do a dorsiflexion with his foot. Um, again, just so you can see some more. So motor strip stimulation, lots of lasers. And then the same thing so you can get a back so you can see another different angle. All right. Um, another really cool device that I like to use is called the Sabo Stem Spa. Uh, so they basically put Epsom salt, you put this uh, methanol cream or the tablet inside, you drop these electrodes inside of the actual water and uh, it uses the water as a current to also help out with uh, muscle activation in the lower extremities. Some of my favorite stem pod placements on the lower extremity um, the other thing here is also using the stem pod um, actually on the actual toes. 
Um, love, 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 love using stomach 45, one of my favorite acupressure points. Anyone who's got paralysis, if you take that right there and you put that directly on the stomach 45 uh, point, uh, it's been pretty favorable with getting our patients to start getting a lot of reactivity in the lower extremity. Um, some research over the brain controlled interfaces. Um, just again, if you want to start looking, see what they're doing is here. They're basically, we're doing, uh, images over the motor strip area. My favorite place to stimulate with the spinal cord patient, by the way. And then here's just some research to show that how they were actually putting electrodes to help out with gait. Um, and then they also put vibration on the arm to also help out with gait control. All right. Let's see. The other portion here is, um, is again, this came from study in Parkinson's patients, but I love using metronomes just to show basically what happens with using sound in different parts of the brain. Um, but this is me working with Emma. So we're doing a crawl scrawl pattern. I have a really cool story about Emma. Emma actually came to see me years ago. And uh, Emma was, um, I want to say she was 16 when her accident happened. She was on an ATV going up a hill and she fell off. The ATV landed on her, basically her abdominal and it crushed her T10. Um, when I got her, she was very discouraged because she's tried therapy everywhere and her parents drug her to see me. And she was like, what is another doctor going to do? And she told me that, and I asked her, I said, what would make you believe that what I can do is gonna work? And she said, if you get my big toe to move, and I said, which one? And she said, my right one. And I was able to get her big toe to move actually on the first visit, which was pretty cool. And then what happened is, is Emma basically was with me throughout her whole entire uh, college. Um, and so Emma is now standing, she's walking, and Emma is now in her second year of med school. And the cool thing is, is that I actually hired Emma to come work for me for the summers. And I remember the first day I called Emma, I was like, Emma, I want you to come work for me. And she's like, why? And I was like, because I want you to come work for me. And she goes, I have a disability. And I was like, no, you don't. And she was like, yes, I do. I even have this the uh, handicap sticker to prove it. And I started laughing with her and I was like, look, don't ever claim that you have a diagnosis. And I was like, rebuke that thing. And the really cool thing is that she actually developed a fascination of actually working with me that she told me, she said, you know what? I actually want to go to school to be a doctor because if someone ever ends up in a wheelchair and has a spinal cord injury, I want to tell them that it's possible that you can actually walk again. And it's really cool because I was able to be part of Emma's journey, um, literally from being a uh, basically... Uh, 16, literally being in high school, all the way through her college, and then hiring her as an employee to come work for me. And she stuck it. She's not walking fully. She's walking with a four-pronged walker and a cane. But it was really cool to basically watch this beautiful young girl go from, you know, a wheelchair to helping her out to now she's going to basically be the same thing as me and helping other people with spinal cord injuries recover. Um, so that was just to show, so I have some different ways to use a metronome. You can basically passively alternate the foot to the beat. Uh, you can do hill slides, you can do knee extensions, you can do a crawl crawl pattern, which is what we were doing. Then you can get the patient standing and then eventually doing a crawl crawl pattern. And those are some ways that I'll basically activate, um, rhythmic movement to try to help a patient walk. And then I'll I have an end story. That has... Uh, I will walk again one day, whether it takes another year or two or have a long, I know it's going to be a long road, but fully feel I'll be there one day. I was very skeptical at first. I work in the medical field and he and his staff both took us in under their wings and they've become family to us. We look forward to coming back.
We leave here feeling refreshed, renewed, a glimmer of hope. And everyone did he tell us that walking was not an option. He was actually the first one to tell us that he would walk our little girl down the aisle again. He's been a blessing to us. The knowledge he has on nerves and spinal cord and everything has just blew us away. It's unbelievable. It really is. And until you see it, you don't understand. Come on. Yeah. Well, the coolest thing for me is to be able to watch a patient who was told that they're never going to walk, they're never going to speak, and then internally they just know that there's something deep, there's something missing. And when they start coming and doing laser therapy and, and doing our approach, they get the results that they're asking for because they never gave up. That was some weighing on my mind, having a daughter and knowing that, you know, one day I walk her down the aisle and then the accident happened and I was crushing that I might not be able to do that. Now where I'm at, you know, it's, it's possible now. It really takes a lot off of me because I was worried about that. Having a spinal cord injury, especially his level at T10, you know, the nerve innervation to his lower extremity really shouldn't be as strong. And it's really cool because he was actually able to walk without any type of AFO support. And I mean, he just took like 28 steps without having to have any additional support. And from being able to told he was never going to walk again, and then to be able to literally walk all the way across the room, I mean, man, that's like the best feeling and best thing to actually watch. So I'm super proud of Ben. He's a warrior. And that's the kind of people we want. All right. Um, those of you guys that, um, you know, that are doing this stuff or watching the recording, uh, I do post a lot of videos on social media, a lot of different cases. Uh, I've had, I've literally had one doctor um, one time actually, uh, was actually able to literally help her child out just by watching um, and following me on social media and just applying stimulation. And really, that's all I'm trying to do is basically educate. So whether you're a doctor or a therapist, uh, or even if you're, you know, just a mom or a caregiver that are listening to these, you know, that's the goal for me is really to educate people. Um, obviously you can see that I'm going to dump a lot of information and content to you. So it might be kind of like drinking from a fire hose, but, um, I just tell people I'll never give someone just this much. I'm always going to over deliver. And what I just did is I gave you guys at least a, hopefully a different thought process of how to work with spinal cord injuries. Uh, because again, uh, you know, I'm a dad, I have two beautiful children and a lovely wife. And um, it, God forbid, if something ever happened to me, I would want someone to basically be out there to help me out. And within that, it requires us to really start to really know more than the person next to us. Now, if there's any competition, it's just that there's a demographic of people just like my patients that they were told that they're never going to basically be able to do that. And deep down inside, they're not accepting that no. And people will fly all over the entire world to come see you. This week, I have a family from Saudi Arabia. I have a kid from Croatia. I have a kid from Nazareth, Israel. Um, I have two families coming in from Ohio. People fly all over the world to come see me. And I'm in a very small town. Uh, I'm not in a very big town like Atlanta, Georgia, Austin, Texas, Dallas. I'm in a very small town in Louisiana. And when you can start to deliver results, people are going to find you. Um, and again, I just post what I do on social media and people come. And then the other thing, if anyone wants to, I did publish a book in November. It is called Cracking the Code of Autism. And um, you guys can read. I wrote a lot of information of how I help autistic children out to actually speak. 
And I uh, thank everyone for joining, especially all the guys on the recording. Um, and then we'll get up this recording out to everyone. And then next month, um, uh, again, it was our apologies because uh, I had to travel. And then Dr. Crawford's been busy with just trying to finish up this research project he's doing. Um, and then we did realize it was the end of the month. So uh, I wanted to make sure that we did the call. Um, and again, I apologize for the late notice, but you guys have the recording. And trust me, this thing is very powerful. So thank you.